Hey, Colleen. How are you? Salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty. Yes, the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. Salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. For the Lord our God is mighty, yes the Lord our God is omnipotent. The Lord our God, He is wonderful. Well, good morning. If we have not met before, um, my name is Hudson, and uh, we hope that you feel welcome here this morning at New Life Glenside. Uh, we're going to start, uh, as we just did, with our prelude, but with our call to worship. And uh, it's going to be from Revelation 19, um, and we're using it as a blueprint for uh, our time of worship this morning. Um, and it's going to be talking about heavenly things. You'll hear that throughout the service today. Um, and I, I know for, for me, I can often feel kind of detached from, um, from what is heavenly when I'm thinking about what is going on right now in my life. Um, and so that's really why we have a call to worship. It's, it's this moment where we orient ourselves before we go and we sing. Um, and as we'll be singing later in the service, uh, we are, I think that when we come into a service like this, um, our hearts are just longing for a taste of heaven's joy. 
um, right now in our, in our daily life. And so um, just for a moment, sort of cast your mind to tomorrow morning. Um, it's great that we are here as a body and we get to sing together, but tomorrow morning is Monday and it's the beginning of a work week. Um, and so we need to ask the Lord in this time that, that we would have a heart that is longing to give him praise because he is a good and faithful savior to us, not just on Sundays, but on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. Um, and so, yeah, we just, we just long for that taste of heaven's joy. And so we're going to hear about that in uh, our call to worship this morning. So you can stand uh, with us. And um, as you hear the phrase hallelujah, the word hallelujah, you can respond with a resounding hallelujah um, as we uh, hear this call to worship this morning. I heard what sounded like a roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah. Hallelujah. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. So we're going to start by singing um, thanks and praise. And this is a new song for most of us, so feel free to uh, listen as we get started and then join in as you feel uh, like you've got the hang of it. We are here together to lift our hearts as one. We're in our Father's presence. His Spirit is with us. Sing it is good. It is good to lift the name of the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. For His heart is overflowing with love for us. And His mercy we can never contain. Each and every morning, we tell of His great love. His faithful mercies and all that he has done for who can match for who can match his kindness and who can count his words oh let our praise continue till evening draws in close it is good it is good to lift the name of the lord our god it is right to give him thanks and praise his heart is overflowing with love for us, and His mercy we can never contain. It is good. It is good to lift the name of the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. For His heart is overflowing with love for us, and His mercy we can never contain. Oh, glory. Right. 
We are going to recite together as one voice um, the words from question one of the Heidelberg Catechism here, um, and they should come up on the screen in just a moment. Um, and so I will uh, read our, our question, and then we will all respond together. So Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful, faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has delivered me from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone, what is our only confidence, that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end. The love of Christ in which we stand. Sing, oh, hallelujah. Oh, sing, hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing, hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our open life. is good, oh God is good, where is his grace and goodness known, in our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh. Unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope. Oh, 
Christ our hope in life and death. our hope in life and death now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Feel the world is broken. And do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish you could see it all made? All creation groaning is a new creation coming. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? Yeah. 
take a seat. Good morning, New Life. Good morning to those online as well. Hudson and Brianna uh, and the team, thank you for leading us this morning in worship. This is why we have corporate worship, because you go, the week is hard, life is hard, and we need to come together in the morning, believers gathering together and singing the truth of God to ourselves, reinforcing these great truths because life can wear us down, right? And so this morning, your worship was like rain falling on parched ground for me. Thank you. Uh, with those who are taking the offering, please come forward. Um, and uh, we heard the, the call to worship from Revelation 19. Salvation and glory and power belong to God. And what's amazing about that verse is that God delights us with all his power and all his glory he delights to have us, limited, weak people, finite, participate in his work of salvation. And one of the ways we do that is by the giving of our money, our gifts, our tithes, so that the gospel can go out, not just to this church and, just, and to our community, but also the whole world. That's what we do here on Sunday morning with our offering. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Everything is from you, Lord. And so we give back to you willingly from our hearts what you have given to us so that the gospel of grace can spread throughout the world. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Okay, a few announcements here. <clears throat> Number one, Thanksgiving meals. Did you sign up to provide a Thanksgiving basket? Thank you. Uh, the deadline, by the way, is within an hour and a half. <laughs> it's a coming upon you. So drop your food items in the fellowship hall across the way and drop your bag or your box on the tables that have the size of the family uh, that you signed up to give food for, all right? So get there before one o'clock and definitely bless Sally by doing that. Number two, um, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln declared that the last Thursday of the month would be a national day of Thanksgiving. And we participate in that by having our annual Thanksgiving Day service here next Thursday at 9.30 in the morning. This, if you've, not, if you've not been here, this is a lovely service. We gather together and we share testimonies with one another of what God has done for us in our lives over the past year. And so we invite all of you uh, to give a brief testimony, no more than three minutes, if you would, so that all of us can give um, and, and encourage one another with, with what God has done. So plan out what you're saying Write it down. Don't be afraid to even get up here and read it to stay within that time limit, if you would. But it's a beautiful service, 9.30 a.m. next Thursday. Number three, if you're having Thanksgiving di dinner at home, and if you have an extra seat or two, there are folks in our congregation who would be blessed by you having them over uh, for Thanksgiving dinner. So if you can host, or if you're someone who's looking for an open chair in a home, contact Jerry Johnson. Her picture is on the slide, and her cell number is in the bulletin, so shoot her a text message. Number four, uh, we heard a wonderful uh, firsthand testimony last Sunday from Rebecca Serlick uh, about the joy of sharing Christmas by buying a gift for children. And that web page for signing up to give a gift to a child will appear next Sunday um, on our website. And there'll be details in the bulletin, so look for that. Number five, uh, Christmas caroling. It's that time. Yep, it's right around the corner. Bruce Johnson, who every year leads new lifers across the town, 
uh, to sing carols, and we have four events, as you can see, coming up. And may I point out one of them that I think is especially special, if I could double my words here. Saturday, December 2nd at 5.45 p.m., the Ardsley Community Center. Why is it special? It's my neighborhood. <laughs> and I can just go across the street and be there, be right there. Number six, our annual craft fair is Saturday, December 2nd from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It's big this year. There are 30 plus vendors that you can walk around and find some Christmas gifts. The New Life Nursery School is going to have some edible fundraisers to support them. Uh, and we're looking for some volunteers to help. It's a big deal. So contact Greg Razor. His email is in the bulletin. Uh, we would also love for you to promote this. So we have some pre-Christmas lawn ornaments <laughs> that you can put on your front lawn to promote this. And um, please do. They're downstairs uh, as you exit. Um, and seven, I'd like to invite our dear sister, Rosemary Miller, to come up and share a missions update. For those of you who are relatively new to New Life, Rosemary and her husband Jack founded New Life 50 years ago this year. And she is still serving the Lord in London. So let's listen to Rosemary. You know, I don't think the Bible says anything about retirement. In fact, I think the apostles all retired with their heads chopped off. So. <laughs> Maybe I hope that wasn't happened to me. <laughs> New life started uh, by uh, broken people, and uh, and I think I believe it still ministers to to broken people. Um, one last thing before I share. Uh, Thanksgiving is a, a, a wonderful day of the year. Sometimes it's very hard for others. But in London, they don't celebrate a Thanksgiving day because they're not going to be thankful that we left the, <laughs> left the main, uh, the, the big... Uh, uh, continent, I mean, the, the, the big uh, the, the kingdom of uh, the United Kingdom to come here and start over. So there's no holiday. So we can't, we can't eat until all the people uh, have, the, because it's a work day. So they, they can't even eat until the evening. But the big thing is that we invite the whole church and they invite the whole church, invite their friends. And uh, sometimes it is over 100 people that come. So that's Thanksgiving, isn't it? Anyway, <clears throat> thank you for being here. Uh, when I spoke at the women's Bible study, Ed Spector took me through this building, and uh, I was just awed by the beauty of it. So I'm just very thankful to be here. Uh, many years ago, I walked into a room in London where I met Dr. Raju Abraham and heard his passion for the lost in India. He had been a neurosurgeon in a local hospital in Southall and left his uh, post to, to do exactly that, went to India, to a very difficult place in India. So I sat there listening, ready to pack my bags and join him. Uh, but we still keep in touch. It took many years before I was able to go to India, but first went to South Hall to meet and teach and mentor Indian women, mostly from the Punjab. And when I finally went to India, I shared the true truth of, of sonship. It was just, uh, just a very special. Now I have, as uh, many of you know, a... Uh, a grandson who serves in Kolkata. Uh, <clears throat> but what I'd learned in a more life-changing way 
is that the kingdom of God is Christ ruling and reigning over all the kingdoms of the world at a cost of the death and resurrection of his son. God has a plan to bring the lost into his kingdom. And his plan included the original 12, and now the church worldwide, and now New Life Church. <clears throat> After his resurrection, Jesus met with his disciples with his word, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to know everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the end of the age. Now, New Life supports us, supports our family, uh, and supports many. I hope you don't think that, that you should be satisfied that you have just supported them but that you yourself have a calling. You may not be overseas, but it is to neighbors and friendly. This is a command, and there is the promise we do not go alone. God is with us. Don't ignore this command. For many years, it was difficult for me to share the gospel. <clears throat> it isn't that I didn't know it, but I don't think it was deep in my soul and my heart. <clears throat> uh, so I almost died four, four years ago, and since then, another, another, another time. And, it, and, it, and then for some reason, and then suffering often does this. Suffering has a purpose. And the suffering for me was... I have a story to tell. And all of you, too, do have. Uh, we have a story of forgiveness to tell, of God reaching into our lives and changing our self-centered heart into a heart for the broken, the needy, and the lost. I'll be 99 in another month. Physically weak, needy, always asking for prayer for an enlarged heart, a clear head, and a simple and pure devotion to Christ, but still planning to return to South Hall in uh, early January. In London, <clears throat> I have a Bengali neighbor, and he's always very friendly, always wanting to talk. And on a sunny day, even in COVID, <clears throat> he called me over uh, to his uh, house. <clears throat> and since we couldn't, Talk. I mean, we couldn't be close together. He brings out a little piano stool, the, the swivel kind, the little small, and, uh, the, and I sat on it, and the stools tipped, and I went down to the ground. So that's a great, a great way to start a, a witness to somebody. <laughs> <clears throat> but I said, I almost died, and I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? And, and of course, he didn't know where he was going. And, and I know he knows, doesn't know that. But you know, you can share the gospel, and that's what we must do. But we believe the results up to, up to Jesus. So I'm sorry he didn't. I, I, I saw him at another time also, and again, I just asked him, and and uh, I just went in, and he be, invited me into his hub, and I saw his back garden, and it was so beautiful. And he went out and picked a bouquet of flowers for me, which was really sweet. <laughs> but I wanted more. I wanted the gospel to reach him. <clears throat> On another occasion, I was meeting uh, where a few people gathered to hear the last words of their local guru. So in England, or, or especially through India, you have, I, you have uh, a Hindu, you have idolatry, you have worship of gods, multiple gods. And then you, the people who break away from that 
uh, worship a guru that lived 300 years ago. And if you don't like him, then there's another group called Radha Swami, and they have their local gurus every year. So, you know, you, you cover all your bases. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so we met together in a room, and then they share the, the, the readings of their local gods. And uh, I had my book from Fruit of Freedom next to me, and the lady saw it, and she says, oh, I need to walk in freedom. And uh, I said, fine, you know, let's have lunch. And that lunch morphed into a beautiful friendship. Now, uh, to my shame, I'm not sure I ever really clearly shared the gospel with her, but it came out in, in, in conversations. But uh, it, 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 it was just such a sweet thing. It was interesting the, uh, that, uh, that Lindsay this morning mentioned about the, the young, the rich young ruler. And instead of God blasting him, he just loved him. And so that's what we do. You love somebody, you want to share the truth with them. <clears throat> a few nights ago, I, ha I met with three women, friends from many years ago, many, many years ago, and these three ladies meet uh, weekly to pray together. And they're in their 70s. And they said to me, what do we expect to face in our old age. And I said, without the long view of looking to, to the future glory, uh, you will sink into yourself and then self-pity. So it, it's an adventure to fix your mind, and, and this is what all of us should be doing anyway, fix our minds on what uh, what Christ has done to make a future for us, and then to consider what the future is and work for that. That's why we want to tell people about Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in his prayer I, that he wanted, to be, wanted us to be with him to share his glory. If you read John 17, he starts out with, the glowing, glowing uh, explanation of to the Father, I long for your glory. I long to be with you. And then, then in the middle of the, the 17, he, he says, I long to have all of you be with me. He longs for that. But he longs for us to look forward to it. He longs for us to be uh, part of the ongoing glory that he wants to give us for now. <clears throat> so I might plead to you to see your family, your neighbors, your co-workers as broken people needing to know that God sent his son out of his love. Maybe this is unfamiliar to you. Maybe we did, but then ask the Spirit to show you how to do it. The Holy Spirit was sent to teach you, to lead you, to train your hearts in ways you had never expected. Well, it's a sorry world, isn't it? It's hard to watch the news. In fact, uh, it, it, it just is painful. It's, uh, but it's a needy world. So we pray, we give, we go, but not alone. God bless. I'm going to pray for Rosemary, but I wanted to sit down at this point. But uh, I was telling Rosemary in the first service, I was um, on a video phone call, video um, conversation with a church, a bunch of elders in Virginia this past week who were consulting with us about things that we do and they needed to hear how we do things. And um, in the midst of that conversation, I had said something about sonship and what I learned from them 
and their eyes widened up and they said, Sonship? And I said, yes, it, was, it started in our church with Jack and Rosemary Miller. And they went, your church is Jack and Rosemary Miller's church? And I went, yes. I felt you know, pretty proud about that. <laughs> and, uh, and then he said, can I have your autograph? <laughs> you made me famous just by knowing you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our dear sister, the mother of this church, the one who long ago and even up to this minute continues to pour her heart out for you because she knows you poured your heart out for her. And so I continue to pray and we pray together that you would continue to bless the work of her hands, um, particularly as she goes back to London. Give her safety, give her protection, and continue to give her the joy that she evidently has in sharing Jesus with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, last announcement. Uh, we're going to stand up, uh, meet, greet, stretch. But I always want to say we have a wonderful prayer team that comes up here after the service. And if you need to be prayed for or prayed over, um, there are some wonderful people for you to, to meet there. God does not want you to walk in your faith alone, particularly through troubles. He has brought us one another. So please avail yourself of that great gift and opportunity. All right, stand up, stretch, say hello, and when the music starts, we'll sit down.
So as mentioned, we are coming up on Thanksgiving, which is a great day to stop and reflect on God's work in your life and his blessings. But Thanksgiving can also be a very hard day for many of us. It's the beginning of the holiday period. And there are times in all our lives, and many of you are here right now, where um, you're in a season of turmoil and trouble and suffering. And some of you have been in it for a long time. And it can feel like, where are the blessings? You're more used to the hardship and the struggles and the suffering. And it can be hard to believe that you are blessed by God. It can be hard to pray. That's one reason why we have corporate prayer, okay? It's for times like these. God knows it can be hard for you to lift up your voice when you're feeling so bowed down, so low, uh, when depression or despair or anger or confusion is just swirling around you. I've been in that place many times and I'm sure you have as well. So God has given us his word and specifically the Psalms and he's given us one another so that we might pray in unison with one another, lifting one or another up, particularly when we are at a weakened state in our lives, when we have a hard time moving toward God and he knows that. God remains an abundantly available help in times of trouble. So if this is you this morning, join in with the prayer, which is going to refer back to verses through the entire Bible, but especially the Psalms, as we ask God to be our abundantly available help in times of trouble, because he's close to the brokenhearted. Let's pray. Lord, you created us and you redeemed us. But you also know, Lord, that we are but flesh, weakened by life and still struggling with sin, going our own way. But you said of us that you loved us so much and you loved the world that you sent your only son so that we would be rescued and saved. You loved us so much that you would step into our broken world and die in our place to redeem us. We know that, but we still struggle so much. We carry around this treasure you have given us in jaws of clay. We are like the psalmist who cries out, my tears have been my food day and night. Why are you so cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God, for my soul is full of troubles. Your word, Lord, gives us words to speak to you about our lives. Remind us, Lord, that when we are that low, when we are low, that you have not forgotten us, that your gracious hand remains upon us, that in the midst of trials, your steadfast love never leaves us, never forsakes us, because you, Jesus, were in fact forsaken for us so that we would never be. We thank you that you understand our troubled hearts, that you do not recoil from us when we bring our troubles and our complaints to you. Draw us to yourself when we find it hard to move toward you. Strengthen us, Lord, during these times. Remind us that our suffering is working within us, your life and your glory, so that we do not lose heart, because it is by your spirit that you renew us inwardly day by day. Oh, fill our hearts with this great comforting truth that your grace is sufficient for whatever comes into our life. That your power comes in our lives through our weakness. Remind us that whatever comes from your hand 
comes from your sovereign wisdom. And even though we might not know what the troubles are for or where it will lead, you are still, as the psalmist said, the God of my salvation. For Lord, you are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love for all who call upon you. That only you, Lord, can take the brokenness of our lives and by your infinite wisdom and sovereign love that you will work all things together for good according to your purposes. Oh Lord, we pray for many in this congregation now who are in the midst of trouble and turmoil and deep waters. We pray for Ed Coley who returned to the hospital again last night with a troubling fever after having kidney surgery this past week. Oh, we pray for his health, Lord. We pray that you would lift him up physically. We pray for Susan Fogg as she continues to uh, rehab in a facility after her back surgery. We ask that she would come home soon, strengthened and able to walk. For Carol Savello, who continues to recover after a stroke and her long, long battle with multiple sclerosis. For Carlos Ramos' family, and for his father, Fernando, that you would, by your mercy, grant him more and more recovery so that he would be strengthened, strengthened enough to come to the states for medical care. Oh, we pray for your wisdom upon Carlos and Rita as they make decisions to care for Carlos's family. We pray for Azor, Azor, still recovering from a serious auto accident from which, Lord, you graciously spared her life. Heal her, lift her up. And we lift up all those with life-altering disabilities and for those who love and persevere in caring for them. Give to them the daily strength to live for you in great weakness. And give to them, Lord, a greater knowledge of your steadfast love to fill their hearts with joy through the long journey that you have called them to walk. We pray for our missions organizations, Surge, MTW, Greater Europe Missions, that you would give them all that they need to do your work around the world. And so, Lord, we name the many missionaries, both local and uh, overseas, um, that, we, that we walk with them and we support. For Joe and Bev, Elizabeth, Russ and Debbie, Drew and Linka, Rick and Donna, Harold and Sarah, Mark, Elizabeth, Tom and Lisa, Allison, Christy, Ben and Ray, Joe, Bob and Nancy, Jill, Dan and Ginny, Karen, and for Bob and Karen and Rosemary and Ethan and Pampa, Lord, all of them, pour out their lives for you uh, in their work that you have called them to do. Protect them, encourage them. Bless the work of your, their hands in your service. And Lord, we pray for your people all around the world and especially your church in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Oh Lord, we cry out for peace in the midst of horrible war. Oh, may you give to your people courage to show the light of Christ to all of those who are living in such awful suffering. We ask that you would bring it to an end. And finally, Lord, we pray for Lindsay. As he preaches here this morning, may your words flow through his words to turn our hearts and our minds toward you, the God who saves, the one whose steadfast love is new every morning the only God who is worthy of all blessing and honor and glory forever and ever. And we pray this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, I need to introduce Lindsay. I'm sorry. I got things to do and I'm just <laughs> scattered. Okay, Lindsay. Lindsay Brooks is a ruling elder at Cresham Valley Church in the Chestnut Hill area. He is also a, mu a musician 
who has composed music for film and TV. He is a new media content developer. And if you were in the adult Sunday school before this service, you have found out that he is a theologian of apologetics. So he taught that class this morning as well. Uh, he was a longtime co-host of apologetics.com radio show in Los Angeles. Lindsay is the husband to Jamila, and they have four children and two grandchildren. And I'm delighted that you are here this morning, and so are we. Thank you, brother. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you tell I used to do radio? <laughs> Okay, so um, just a point of order. If you open your bulletin, there's a little insert. And this morning, I failed to properly signpost some of the, uh, the outline. So it's my hope to do a better job this morning. So I'm going to leave this here so I can just kind of check on myself. The other thing is that I come from a preaching tradition that doesn't watch the clock. <laughs> and I, I found out that half an hour goes really fast. <laughs> I'm going to set a, a timer, but I'm probably going to ignore it. <laughs> okay. Saints, today we are going to dive into a love letter. We're going to read first, then we'll pray together, then hopefully we'll focus and gather what God has for the churches. The letter from Jesus to the church at Laodicea by the hand of John, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of God's creation, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined from the fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says for the church. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for this letter. Thank you for all of the letters to churches. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you for mysteries that we can dive into and plumb the depths of and find comfort and promises and love and fulfillment. Open our minds today to learn what you have for us. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Does it sound like a love letter, saints? Be honest. It sounds a little harsh, right? But it is a love letter. 
Um, Revelation is one of these books. <laughs> you know, early in your Christian walk, some of you older saints know this, and, and some of you new saints who uh, have made the attempt, like I did as a teenager, to read through the entire Bible, have come to this kind of uh, adventure. You start in Genesis, don't you? And you read Genesis, and you recognize a lot of things, and it's narrative, so it's kind of easy to get. There might be some hard stuff in there. There's stuff you go, ooh, that's harsh, but, but you get it, right? And you start reading Exodus, and it continues with this narrative story of the family of God being, being brought through history. And you come to about chapter 36 of that, and there's all this detail about how to build stuff. You might quit there. You might even get to Leviticus. And, and uh, while you may learn to love Leviticus, it usually doesn't begin that way, does it? It starts out as a bunch of laws and things you don't understand or understand the context of. You're like, wow, God commanded that? That's, a, that's just weird, right? And so you abandon the project and you say, as I did, let's start from the end of the story. So you flip to the end of the, and you find Revelation, and you say, surely, if I understand the end of the story, I'm going to get everything that kind of comes before, and I can kind of go back and pick up the pieces. So you start to read Revelation, and it gets weird about chapter 5. <laughs> so you're like, all right, all right, I'm going to read Matthew. <laughs> but Revelation is really one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love Job, but I love Revelation. Uh, it took years. It took time. It took stacks of books and some really good preachers and teachers and patient teachers to bring me to the point where I could look at Revelation and, and begin to pull on these threads. You know what I found, saints? I found that as you begin to pull on the threads it takes you back through the entire rest of the New Testament to the Old Testament. And you start to be able to see through these, through these it, lenses. It's sort of like the lenses of like a telescope, right? Or a camera. You have a lens that focuses on, say, the Old Testament and, and enlightens that. And through both of those lenses, you see Jesus better. That's revelation. That's what we've approached. I hope that you found that in your adventure so far through these seven letters to churches. Okay, let's get into the letter. This is a letter that follows a lot of the same structure of the other letters. Have you guys noticed the structure of the other letters? Right? Let, let's talk about that structure a little bit. I'm going to flip open my Bible. I got this one at uh, General Assembly this year, and it's new, so some of the pages kind of stick together. And the print's a tiny bit small, so I need glasses. Forgive my wrestling. Okay. So first, you have a description of Jesus. Some, uh, some description, right? And that description comes mostly from the vision that John had in chapter 1. Did you guys notice this? First you get, um, yeah, let's, start, let's see what happens in Ephesus, right? First, in Ephesus, he says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. That's, that's from chapter 1. And, and blessedly in chapter 1, those images are actually explained to you. Uh, it says, As for the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars... Are the, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, so it's actually explained to you, this, this 
vision, this image. And each of the churches draws something from this vision in chapter 1. Now, the image, the image that's drawn here in the seventh letter uh, are also, are also kind of given to us in this uh, overture that happens in, in chapter one. You guys know what an overture is in music, right? It's where you hear all the themes. They tell you the themes that are going to be expanded upon. You know, John did this in, in his gospel, didn't he? Like that first 18 verses of the gospel of John is like an overture. He tells you all these themes he's going to keep hitting again and again through the rest of the book. Well, th it happened here too. And in this letter, um, rather than coming from the vision, though, it comes from sort of the very introduction to the letter. So let's take a look at that. To the angel of the church at Laodicea, the, the words of the Amen, faithful and true witness, beginning of God's creation. You see that? Now, let's go back to our overture and see those themes, okay? Okay. Flip back, and let's take a look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Interesting. We have, this time not from the, the vision, not feet of bronze or that sort of thing, but, but from this tripartite, this three-part description. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. It's very interesting. Let's take a look and see what some of those things might mean. The amen. He's describing himself as the amen. What does amen mean? It's you might have heard it said, verily. Have you heard that? Verily. What does verily mean? Truth, right? Amen is an assent to the true thing. Is anyone else besides Jesus called the amen in Scripture? One, only one. Flip in your Bible, kind of in the middle, to Isaiah chapter 65. And you will find, myself here, in verse 16, It says, uh, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. Do you read that? Belohe, amen. Amen. That's amen. The God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. You see that? Belohe, amen. Because the former troubles are forgotten and hidden from my eyes. Who is this? This is God himself. The only person to be called the amen in the entirety of scripture. Jesus is calling himself God. Do you see it now? That's powerful. Saints, I didn't see this on that first read-through as a teenager. Right? I'm a little bit like the guy who goes to the kitchen to make a sandwich and opens a refrigerator to look for the mustard. And I look and I just don't see it. I need it. 
because it's going to make it yummy, right? And I go looking around and begin to panic that I'm going to have a mediocre sandwich experience. So I hide my uh, anxiety and I call out, honey, there's the mustard right in front of you. Where? Ah, the exasperated sigh, the accelerated stomping, and picks it out right in front of me where I could not miss it. There it was. Well, here it is. Jesus is calling himself God for you. This is going to become incredibly important as we go through your little page where it says an apologetics moment. Think about this. God first, Jesus first calls himself God. Then he says, the faithful witness. The faithful and true witness. He is the true Israel. This also from Isaiah. So these are sort of two explicit references back to the Old Testament. Please remember this about Revelation. As you read through it and you think something is weird, there's a good chance it has context from the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah, again. Chapter 43, verse 10. He says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. So you can continue to read. But what you find here is that Jesus fulfills this role of the true and faithful witness. If Israel is to be the true witness to the world, by the end of, by the, end of the Old Testament, we're kind of thinking that there might be a problem, right? Because after, the, after Ezra and Nehemiah, you find, well, you know, we were, it was going to be so great. We rebuilt the wall and the temples, and then, and then uh, you know, things kind of fell apart again, didn't they? So that by the end of Malachi, in the book of Malachi, God is very upset with Israel at that time. Was, Israel the, was that iteration of Israel the true and faithful witness? Not really. Jesus calls himself the true and faithful witness. He is the fulfillment of all of your scriptures. This has consequences. He goes on to say, the beginning of God's creation. The beginning of God's creation there will be those who will tell you that this means that Jesus was created. That's actually not true. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses have been out. I, I live on the campus of University of Pennsylvania, and the Jehovah's Witnesses has a, have been out around 40th Street a lot. And uh, they're all very nicely dressed. <laughs> But they will tell you that Jesus was created as the Archangel Michael. Created. This one who just called himself God, the Amen. Well, what's going on here with this, with this uh, beginning of God's creation? Uh, in Greek, the, the word there is arche. Right? You remember from the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and arche, and halagos in Greek. Arche, that's the word. So let's, let's poke around that a little bit. Arche uh, 
is employed in several ways here. It, it means first. It means first in preeminence. So uh, Colossians 1.17, you don't have to flip there, I'll read it to you. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That's, that's a statement of his preeminence. Head also means the source, like the source of a river, right? Uh, so RK, in this case, uh, I would look to John 1, 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Uh, he is the source of all things because he created all things. It also talks about his authority. RK can also mean rule or ruler. So Ephesians 1, verse 21 says, Christ is seated far and above all rule. That's RK. And authority and power and dominion. That means his rule and authority and power and dominion is far above that. All of this context comes to play here, but this most importantly. I, remember I told you the overture thing, right? Uh, Revelation 1.5, our little overture says that he's the firstborn from the dead. Oh. He's the beginning of the new creation, saints. The beginning of the new creation. All of us who believe in Jesus are in him. And in him we are what? A new creation. So I believe that this is the sense that we should be taking this. I think that this is complex, but it's not beyond our grasp, is it? It's kind of right there in front of us like the mustard. Okay. So preceding letters had a lot of rich Old Testament references and were based very much in, the, uh, in the, the vision that John had. But this one goes before the vision to the overture. That's a difference. Um, there's a book written, uh, edited by Gregory Beale called The New Testament Use of the Old Testament. It's one of my standard sources. Every single time I preach in the New Testament, I always want a, a nice reference place where I can look at all the Old Testament references. And what you find is that all of these letters have tons of Old Testament references, explicit ones. This one has two. Uh, the two in Isaiah that I said, in, in that reference work. I think there are others, and, and we'll, I hope we'll kind of stumble into some of them here as we continue, but that's one of the differences that we should see. It's like John was training you to read his work. Isn't that genius? You know, I remember uh, teaching my younger brother to ride his bike. And I rode behind him, I, I, I ran behind him, holding the back of his bike up, and he was like, are you still holding me? I, yes, I'm still holding you. Are you still holding me? Yes, I'm still holding you. Are you still holding me? Nope, you are riding your bike all by yourself. And I think that that's what John is doing here. He was training you to read his book. You see the Old Testament references in the vision, and he keeps leading you to the vision, which leads you to the Old Testament reference, and now you can find them on your own. Isn't that mir miraculous? This kind of literary genius, I think, can only be the Holy Spirit of God. So let's see what the problem is in Laodicea. We talk, we're talking about the, the structure of this book, and, and we said that it begins with, uh, with a description of Christ, and then it goes to commendations. Every single church so far 
has had a con- commendation from Jesus. I know your works and you do this thing pretty good. Not this church. Laodicea doesn't get a commendation. They get a rebuke. That's the next thing that usually happens. So what's the rebuke? The rebuke is, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would be cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, I will. Anybody have this translation? Vomit you out of my mouth. He's disgusted with it. Now, uh, I have heard this preached as lukewarm means that you're only kind of into Jesus and stuff. That's what I've heard it preached as. But it says... I would be fine if you were cold and fine if you were hot, but just not lukewarm. What is it about water that when it's lukewarm is less appealing and less useful than when it's cold or when it's hot? And how does this speak to the situation in Laodicea? Well, let's think about first the geography of Laodicea. They are a little south from a little town called Hierapolis, which in modern-day Turkey is a beautiful hot spring. Google this. Please do. <laughs> Look up ancient Hierapolis, and you're, you're going to come up with a, with a hot springs that the, the modern name of it in Turkey is the Mountain of Cotton because there's so much white limestone that has been churned up by centuries of this hot spring that it looks like a white mountain of snow. It's crazy. It's beautiful. The water is blue and hot. A little east from Laodicea is a town called Colossae. We know it because there's a book in the Bible to the Colossians. And they are in a mountainous part that has cold water running down from mountain streams. Hmm. Would that you were cold or that you were hot. It's very picturesque, and it's very tailored to their exact situation, isn't it? Laodicea didn't have a good water source of their own right close. They used aqueducts to get water from Hierapolis, and from Colossae. Isn't that great? But by the time you get it there, it's either hot or it's it's either warmed up by the sun or it's cooled down on the process, and it's neither hot nor cold. It's lukewarm. Not as yummy. Not as useful. You see, because you could go to the hot springs in Hierapolis and you can bask in the warmth of that water and it has a salubrious, a a health benefit to you. Hot water can do that. You ever have that experience? You come home from a hard day's work. But Lindsay, you've never done a hard day's work. (laughs) You come home from a hard... See, this is why I am going to ignore this You come home from a hard day's work and you lower yourself into the tub and your tensions begin to melt away and you begin to feel back to right again, don't you? Or you've mowed the lawn all morning and it's a hot summer day and you come in and there's a nice cold glass of water and it refreshes you. Now, on the other hand, I've often made coffee And I have kids. You know how it is. You got to go do some stuff. You come back and your coffee is lukewarm. Is it yummy? Eh, If you're into that sort of thing. (laughs) Look, this is what Jesus is trying to tell you. He wants you to be yummy. 
and useful. This is what Laodicea lacked. You see, hot and cold, both good, both useful. Lukewarm, less so. To the point that Jesus wants to vomit them out of his mouth. I said this was a love letter, didn't I? Let's go on. Why were they in this condition, this spiritual condition of lukewarmness, of being fairly useless and not refreshing? Why? For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Again, let's talk about Laodicea as a town. They were situated at a crossroads that led them to great prosperity. they, They had a Jewish population that uh, was populated from the Persian Empire. And one of their uh, convoys was intercepted by a Roman who confiscated 20 talents of gold bound for Jerusalem. There, There was an earthquake in Laodicea, and Rome wanted to send the equivalent of, you know, federal aid emergency aid to them. And they said, no, we're good. They're wealthy. They had uh, wealth in banking transactions and in textiles, saints. They were famous for a certain black sheep that made black wool that they could make beautiful garments out of. And they had a medical school. Cicero wrote about this. There was a medical school, and they, and they made a, a, a salve for the eyes. How well it worked according to science, I don't know, but people raved about it at the time. So what does Jesus, what does Jesus say? He says, I counsel you to buy gold from me refined by fire. Gold, that speaks just something to them. So that you may be rich. See, there are or money rich, but there's a problem here. And then it says, and white garments, white symbolizing purity in this case, so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness not be seen. See all that wealth from that black wool textile that they made and were famous for. Jesus speaks directly to their situation. You see this? And then he says, a salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Hmm. That ophthalmologist uh, medical uh, school that they had there, it wasn't availing them spiritually. The problem is not just that they were rich, saints. People have been rich. Abraham, rich. Job, rich. God God doesn't just despise riches. He's rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's a, a metaphor for wealth. The problem is where you put your confidence. Confidence. Is your confidence in your wealth? The scripture in Proverbs 30 tells us, it says, uh, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you. Oh. Why is this so bad? Well, let's think about the story of salvation and how in the Old Testament 
God spoke to his people again and again, saying this exact thing. Malachi chapter 3, you remember? Uh, You've probably heard this preached as, you know, tithing, right? You're robbing, I'm angry with you because you're robbing God. Well, why was that important? That you're robbing God. Well, because the priests didn't have land. It's what they lived off of. You gave to support them, but then what else? Also, that was the welfare program. That's how you took care of the poor and the needy. But Jesus says, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. You remember that? When did we clothe you? and feed you, and give you shelter. When you did it to the least of these, this is why wealth is so dangerous. It destroys your witness to Jesus Christ because of greed. But this is a love letter. Let's wrap this up by looking at why it's a love letter. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And then there is a tremendous promise that we'll sit on the throne with him if we overcome. And his throne is God's throne. His Father's throne. Oh, the promise. Oh, the relief. If you know your Bibles, you know that Jesus spoke to the rich young ruler. He said, show me the way to salvation. And Jesus said, do the law. And he said, I do the law. He says, okay, one thing you lack, sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. You remember that? And he was crestfallen because he had many possessions. Does the Bible then say Jesus was so angry with him? Cussed him out? No. Jesus loved him. The disciples were amazed at this teaching that a rich man couldn't enter the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. You see why now? It's a trap. That's why he needed to give it away. You're not enriched for yourself, are you? The thief should steal no more and work. Why should the thief steal no more and work? So that he will have more, not for himself, to give. Saints, I clench my money. I have a problem with generosity. even though I'm probably in the top 3% of wealth in the world. And so are you. You've got cars, you've got TVs. Many of you here own your homes. You're top in the world. But I can never get enough. And when you ask for it, I find every reason to limit how much I give you and when. And whenever possible, I try to get some of it back. Oh, forgive me, Lord. 
Behold, I knock at the door. Look, I believe that this is a reference to the Old Testament again, this time Song of Solomon chapter 5, starting in verse 2. The lover's laying in her bed after washing her feet and disrobing, and she's laying in her bed, and the knock comes, and it's the beloved. Cold and wet outside in the night air. Let me in, beloved. Let me in. And she says, I just got in the bed. And I just took a bite. You want me to get my feet dirty again? And he tries the door and it won't open. But him trying softens her heart. And she runs to the door and throws the bolt and opens the door. But her beloved is gone. And her filled with desire for her beloved goes running through the streets of the city. And she gets attacked by the city guard, beaten, and her clothes torn. It's a reprimand. But even with that hardship, what does she say? Oh, daughters of Zion, if you see my beloved, do you, do you hear that, saints? Do you feel that in your soul? Do you feel the desire to keep going back to Jesus? To abandon your comfort in your bed with your feet washed. It is hard to let go of that comfort. I know no one wants to until you see the beloved. Pray that we see the beloved. Remember what Jesus said? hard for a rich man to go into the kingdom of heaven. But all things are possible with God. Let's pray. Gracious Father, you sent your son to come get us. And then when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit of God to fill us. Lord, we look to you to complete your good work in us. Set us on fire from the inside out. Make us hot or make us cold. Let us never just be lukewarm and useless. Make us useful. Make us yummy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can stand with us, and we will uh, respond to what we just heard with, oh, great God. Make me yours forever.